MovieWeb.com. Blake Morrison's story I thought was so poignant. <laughs> I could have been such a prig, but in in the end, he really did love him. You know, regardless of his, uh, you know, his problems. How did this story get to you? I mean, why did you decide to do this film? Was it the father-son relationship primarily? Yes. Um, the you know, I, when I read the book, I, the response I had was was that, and I think that if if you're going to achieve the feat of of a 90-minute story or a 300-page book to make you love somebody that you know is is a is a figment of of, of a narrative, then I think you are more likely to achieve that if you tussle with that character, if you go through the difficulties, if you know you can see what it costs. I think you know it, it, it's very hard to. I don't think it's going. You're going to make anybody love a character that is just sweet all the time. It's just not going to work. You don't. It doesn't chime in with you. Doesn't register anything. Doesn't remind you of anybody. So I think that to paint this man with all his complexities. I'm talking about the father. Um, to expose his narcissism to see that he can be a bully to see all the reasons why the son at times thinks he hates his father it means that by the end when you see the love there it's it's far more powerful because it you know the love is there in spite of all those other things now you know there, there are fathers out there that are beating the shit out of their kids and you know really evil in in an evil sense was there ever a a want or need to maybe make Jim Broadbent's Arthur's character a little bit harsher because he does have that tremendous likable quality to him that he, that he does have in that role. Was there ever a need to be like, maybe he should be a little bit more more mean or vindictive? I think the story had to be told as we all saw it. And I think that very often, you know, if you're the guy, if you, I, this is not a story about a, a father who's abusive on that scale. Although, I think one of the great tragedies about uh, the children who are abused is that they probably still love their father. You know, that, that's probably one of the things that makes it so heartbreaking is that the child who's being beaten will still love the dad. And uh, that's just why I think the abuse is so, so egregious. And uh, we're not going that far, but it's, if you could argue that this sense of a child feeling bullied and ashamed by his father is the very, very thin end of, 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 of that wedge. And um, the boy doesn't stop loving his father even while he hates him. And so I think we have to tell a story about this kind of dad, and I think it's far more universal. I mean, you know, let's hope that most kids in the world are not enduring that extreme abuse that you're talking about. So this is telling a story probably of a majority of people's experience where father's not a villain. It's just he is to you while you're a teenager in a given moment, while you're feeling hypersensitive. And I think that it's... I, th I think that the film it makes a very wise choice to focus in on that very self-conscious moment at 17 when you want to be taken seriously, you desperately want to be seen as the great intellectual, you care what the girl thinks about you, and then father wades in, not only steals your thunder because he's got so much more confidence and charm than you have at that point, and then makes humiliating jokes at your expense. That's the worst thing, at that moment, it's probably the worst thing you could possibly imagine. You probably carry that resentment for years and years and years. And even if you think you've forgiven your dad, he only has to do something to remind you, you know, 20 years later, and it all comes back. And I think that's one of the strange things uh, about our relationships with our parents. We think we've grown up, you know? We may have maybe the CEO of a big company the minute you step through the door and you hear that tone of voice, you're 16 again. I was particularly impressed by, what's the actor's name, Matthew Beard, yes, he's who right played the, the teenage Blake Morrison. Mm. Um, talk, talk about, did you help casting him? Where did he come from? He, was he just came, no, I didn't help at all. I mean, I, we, he just showed up one day. I, he's done very little acting, if any. He was still at school. He was a, an A student, um, just about to go to college. I don't know if, I was, I was actually begging him to go to college and not, not go off and be a movie star too quickly. Um, I think very wisely, again, they did not cast us to look like each other. Um, the boy actually has blue eyes, so they had to put contact lenses and he probably couldn't look much more different. Uh, but he, um, he played, I think they cast him because they wanted someone who was right to represent that character at that age. And they wanted me to represent my character at my age. We all have three very different tasks. We have the bewildered eight-year-old who really doesn't understand what's going on with his father, who has an uncritical worship of his dad. We've got the 17-year-old I just described, 
is beginning to enter into this, this tussle with his father. Now, my job, I suppose, rather unhappily, was to be um, the, the grieving son by the sickbed most of the time. Um, and the reflection, and so I didn't, you know, the Blake that I was playing was not really able to warm up to his father, I think, until the kind of release at the end, you know, when, you know, without wanting to give too much away, but when, when things move on, you know, that he finds that he finds some peace. When did you last see your father? The last time he was healthy, active? The last time you had an argument about something? So I've been trying to recall the last time I actually saw him, the last time he was unmistakably him. <laughs>